Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, if you were to ask the people that you know in your life, the people in your neighborhood, for example, or maybe the people that you work with, if you were to ask them the question, who is Jesus? Probably you'd get a lot of different answers, right? Some might say, well, Jesus, he was an important historical figure. He was a good man. Some people might say, well, he's a prophet. He preached God's word. Some might even say, well, he's, he's the son of God. And, of course, Jesus is all of those things. Today, we get an important opportunity to see and understand who Jesus really is as he makes his journey towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, and as he does that for you and for me. So we're going to consider that theme today. Lent calls us sinners to understand who Jesus really is. And as we consider that, we're going to take a look at the gospel from uh, Mark and his account of Jesus' journey into Jerusalem. We'll start just by reading the first seven verses of that account. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Stop there for now. And these words here, they give us an opportunity to, to marvel at our Savior, marvel at who he is. He is our Savior King. And, and two things in particular make that stand out for us. One is the knowledge that he has. And think about how many times the disciples that he had had that chance to marvel at Jesus. All the miracles that he had done. We mentioned a number of them just before during the children's sermon, right? Here again, they get another opportunity to marvel as Jesus shows them what he knows as God. They're on their way into Jerusalem on that final journey, and they come up to these villages. They're approaching Bethany and Bethphage, two small villages just to the east of Jerusalem, just to the east of the Mount of Olives, if you're familiar with the area there. And as they come, Jesus decides now is the time for something important to happen. And so he sends his disciples and he says to them exactly what they're going to find in one of those villages. He lays it all out. You're going to go in, you're going to find this colt tied up. I want you to untie it, bring it here. Some people are going to ask you something. Don't worry about it. Here's what you say in response. Just bring the colt back here. So the disciples go. And amazingly, they find it all just as Jesus had outlined it for them. The colt is there, tied to a post in front of someone's door. So they start to untie it. The people come and ask the question, what, what are you doing with our colt? And they respond, well, the Lord needs it. He'll send it back when he's done. And they let them go. Imagine the impression in those disciples' minds as they came back to Jesus with that colt, considering all the things that had just happened, just as Jesus had laid it out for them. Jesus knew it all. But you know, that's really only half the story as far as why we can marvel at what Jesus says and does here. Because not only is he simply getting a ride for himself as he goes into Jerusalem, but he does it with a specific purpose in mind. He knows what the Old Testament says. And we read those words from Zechariah not too long ago also, right? Consider those words one more time from Zechariah chapter 9 where he writes, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, 
lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. With those words, Zechariah is saying that this is how Israel's king comes into his city. And he's not talking about just any king, is he? Because he also talks about the peace that this king will bring. Peace that will extend to all nations. His kingdom will range the whole earth. This king can only be that one king that God had promised to send, the Messiah himself, the Savior of all mankind. And so marvel, brothers and sisters, at how Jesus, now knowing all the things that are in that town ahead of them, and also knowing that this prophecy applies to him and to no one else. But Jesus takes hold of that prophecy and says, now is the time to show everybody who I am. And I'm going to do that by riding on this donkey, taking it all the way into Jerusalem and fulfilling that prophecy. So we marvel at Jesus' knowledge for us. Marvel also at how Jesus uses that intimate knowledge in your own life. Have you ever heard it said or, or thought it yourself? I know I have many times and I've heard people say it to me. You know, after they read a certain devotion or portion of scripture, maybe after they hear a certain sermon or, or, or something in Bible class, they think to themselves or they say, man, that was exactly what I needed to hear today. How did, how did God know that this was just the portion of scripture that I needed today? Because maybe I was, I was feeling down and he brought words of comfort, or, or maybe I was needing guidance and he gave me some words of wisdom. Maybe I was strain a little bit, and I needed some words of correction. Maybe I was feeling the weight of my sins, and I needed to hear those words of forgiveness. But isn't that true that, that God does that for each and every one of us? When we need to hear certain words, he finds a way to get them to us. And that's because he knows you. He knows everything about you, all the intimate details of your life. And so he knows also how best to apply his gracious words to your life. What a thing to marvel at. But Jesus now, as he comes into Jerusalem, we marvel not only at his knowledge, we marvel also at his humility. He comes into Jerusalem on this donkey. Not the way most kings would come into a city, right? Right? Think of the, the kings and rulers of today. How do they enter into the cities that they travel to? They come on their luxurious planes, right? And they get in their limousines and they drive. They've got the motorcade and everything, right? Jesus here comes on a beast of burden, a lowly animal. And as he comes in, He's not trumpeting his own name. He's not trying to gain any glory for himself. He comes, as Zechariah says again in his prophecy, humble and lowly, gentle. And isn't that something to marvel at? Because who is he really? He's not just the man that we see. He is God himself, the king of all creation. And for him... To come into this world, to lower himself, become one of us, and then willingly go into a city like this among all these people that he had, has created. What a wonderful thing. And even more wonderful when, when we consider exactly what we are, right? When God made Adam, what did he form him from? Dust of the ground. You and I are nothing but dust, dirt. And think about this. As you go around your house, there's plenty of dust there, maybe. Maybe for some of you there's more than others if you are gracious and you let that dust live a little longer. But as you go through your house and you clean it, you wipe that dust away without a second thought doesn't occur to you that that dust might be important in some way, and of course it isn't important in any way. If anything, it's a nuisance. It makes your house look dirty. And yet, 
Isn't that how we should appear to our God? A nuisance. Not important at all. Yet that is not how God considers us. In spite of all of our sins, all the things we have done to disobey him and deserve his wrath, he instead does the unthinkable thing, something for us to marvel at, and he comes down to us. He joins us in our dustiness, so to speak, as he becomes a human being. And he willingly goes to the cross for us. For us who who are nothing but dust. Why? It's almost impossible to imagine why. Because he loves us. How he could love us, we don't know. But he does. And he loves us so much that he's willing to do whatever it takes to bring us back to him, to save us from our sinfulness, to save us from eternal death. (coughs) That, brothers and sisters, is something to marvel at. And so we marvel at our Savior, as surely his disciples did as well. But as we get to the second part of our text here, we also see the chance to praise our God as the people there praised him. Let's read the next few verses there. 8 through 10. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. So all along the road, as these crowds follow Jesus and and lead him into Jerusalem, they're shouting these words. And maybe not so much of of a coincidence that Jesus has all these crowds around him. Certainly he's he's popular, and the people who have heard he's coming are going to want to go to him. But this would have been normal during this time as well. There were lots of groups going up to Jerusalem at this time because they were headed to the Passover feast. This is what it was Uh, This was the time of year for them to celebrate that important Jewish festival when they celebrated how God had brought their people out of Egypt, saved them from slavery there. And so there's lots of people on the roads. But as they see Jesus and as they hear that he's coming, they praise him with these wonderful words. Why would they praise him? What did they know about Jesus? Certainly, They had heard many things. Heard about the miracles that he had done, as we discussed some of them earlier. The most recent miracle in memory would have been how he raised Lazarus from the dead. And that that miracle was a little bit different from some of his others, if we take a close look at it. Yeah, he had raised other people from the dead, but there at Lazarus' tomb, there were a lot of witnesses. People who had come out to mourn his death from Jerusalem. And we consider, too, Lazarus, he had been dead for four days. Four days lying in his tomb. Whereas the other people that Jesus had raised from the dead seemed to have just recently died. And so this looks a little bit different. This maybe gives people even more opportunity to start talking about what he's done here. And one more detail, they're right there in Bethany where that happened. Jerusalem is just a stone's throw away. And so the word would have spread really fast into that capital city. People knew now what Jesus could do more than at any other time during his ministry. And if he can do that, what other things might he be able to do? Surely this is the one God promised to send. That's what the people are thinking. Their words make that clear. Hosanna! It's a word that means, save us. Save us, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. They knew what the Old Testament said about David's son. He's going to be one of David's sons, descendants, who would, who would bring in this new kingdom that God had promised. This would be the Messiah. By talking about that, they are saying, Jesus, we know who you are. We understand. You are the Messiah, the one God promised to send. And so they praise him because of his power, 
to do the unthinkable. They praise him because of his compassion that he is willing to do these kinds of things for them, these lowly people. And we praise him for that same thing as well. We don't know exactly how much those people understood about what Jesus was still going to go through. It may be that they thought he was coming in to, to throw off the Roman rule over them and start this earthly kingdom where Israel would once again be independent and at the height of, of its power and glory. If so, they were disappointed in less than a week's time. But it's possible, too, that some of them did understand why Jesus had really come to establish not an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual one, one that would bring people from all over the world into its, uh, into its reach. And we, who have the benefit of seeing the whole picture, we understand that. We understand who Jesus really is, that he came to Jerusalem not to establish an earthly kingdom, but that spiritual kingdom, and that there was only one way to do it, by laying down his life in place of your life, and in place of my life. You see, that's the only way that he could do battle against our worst enemies and win. The devil, sin, death itself, those things we can never hope to beat. But Jesus could. Because not only was he man, but he is God himself. He can do battle against Satan and win. He can do battle against sin and come away with the victory. He can defeat even death and come back from that. And we're going to see how all that unfolds in the coming week as we celebrate Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and finally Easter Sunday, the culmination of it all. I hope that you're able to stay with us, join us throughout that week so that we can walk through that journey together. It's a wonderful journey. It gives us the opportunity to see again who Jesus really is and why he has come. He's come to be our Savior, our King. May we praise him all our days. Amen. Please stand if you're able. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>